Oh, see, oh, sisters and brothers and brothers and sisters. Let's right now put our feet on the floor, eyes closed, our hands on our laps. Let's focus on our breath. Taking slow, deep breaths. Take a really deep breath and hold it. Deep breath and hold it. Hold it. Hold it. And out. Visualize, if you will, a light coming from the stars above, right down through the top of your head. Coming down through your head. Moving slowly down your spinal column right on down to your heart. Feeling the empowerment and strength from the spirit above coming down and then imagine if you will a second light rising up from the center of the earth coming up through the base of your spine rising up through your spine into joining in your heart and both lights working intertwined within you, radiating through your body, strengthening every cell in your body, every fiber of your being, radiating out around you, giving you strength of spirit, strength of mind, strength of body. Visualize these lights continuing to flow through us, growing stronger, radiating out from our heart and this radiance growing out beyond us, to all those around us, reminding us that we are one in spirit, sharing the great web of life. In this place, we open our minds, our hearts, and our spirits to the word of our Creator, the wisdom of our Creator the will of our Creator in us, through us, and all around us. Take another deep breath and let it go. Eyes open, relax. Our readings from today, our first reading from today, we're going to go to Proverbs. Proverbs 16, 18, and this is going to be one that everybody's pretty familiar with. Uh, Proverbs 16, 18 reads, Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. In our, uh, our reading today, let's see, we just read from the Hebrew Bible, now we're going to jump over to the New Testament, which is going to be 1 John 2, 15 through 25. Do not love the world or the things in the world. The love of God is not in those who love the world. For all that is in the world, the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, the pride and riches, comes not from God, but from the world. And the world and its desires are passing away. For those who do the will of God live forever. Children, it is the last hour, as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so many Antichrists have come. For this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But by going out, they made it plain that none of them belonged to us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and all of you have knowledge. I write to you not because 
you do know the truth, but because you know it, or you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and you know that no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father, has God. Everyone who confesses the Son has God also. Let what you have heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you will abide in the Son and in God. And this is what he has promised us, eternal life. Now, I lived out in New Mexico for a long time, or we did. We lived out in New Mexico, north, north, northern New Mexico, just outside Taos, for a long time. And uh, one of the, the nice things about being out there is uh, having an opportunity to participate in the ceremonial dances at the Pueblo. And if there's one thing Pueblo people know how to do, it's how to have ceremonial dances. And they have a lot of them for very good reasons. They, they believe in honoring those who give of themselves to help them out and to help out all the people. But they also, too, have in their culture the ability to strive for balance, to be in harmony. And they do this among many American Indian cultures through what is known as the Heokas. The Heoka way is the clown way. And I remember, you know, being at San Juan Pueblo and Taos Pueblo and Nambe and a few others down there that uh, where the uh, the Heokas would come around. And Heoka is actually a Lakota term for the clowns. I uh, just want to make it clear, but I'm speaking of the clowns in general. And in this context, the clowns, you know, they, they, their antics were uh, pretty hilarious. They kept people laughing. And yet, oftentimes they did that by uh, humiliating others. And, you know, trying to keep people to realize that uh, you got to keep a good sense of humor about yourself, but you know the Hyokas, uh they are about keeping the, keeping us uh, balanced, about keeping us grounded, centered. That because, like our readings today, you know they know a haughty spirit brings harm, and so uh, they also demonstrated that clowns are not to be taken lightly. For example, I remember in Taos Pueblo at a deer dance one year. Clowns came out, and this is Taos, New Mexico, in December, which is hardcore winter time. Clowns came out, grabbed somebody, and threw them in the creek. So the clowns, they remind you that if you get too full of yourself, you bring about your own destruction. So clowns are funny to laugh at and they put on some good antics, but it's also a reminder of how dangerous getting, out, getting full of yourself can be. And in the Lakota and Lakota Dakota cultures, the Heokas uh, are taken a little more seriously because many of them are believed by many. I'm not saying it's true, right or wrong, good or bad, but I do know many, many uh, northern people who do believe that uh, Heokas practice bad medicine, that they intentionally inflict harm on others. Uh, the Spanish call them brujas, and, uh, and some of them can do some very serious things. And so we think about that, about how being full of yourself, being prideful, can lead to all kinds of harm <coughs> and what that means. Now, for the Cheyenne, it's a different deal. You know, uh, a hill in the Cheyenne culture is someone who's contrary. 
somebody who does things backwards because they know they're out of harmony. They know that they are in a state of dissonance. And so they do things in reverse to demonstrate to everyone their understanding and their awareness that they are not in balance, that they are not working in harmony with the natural law, the natural order. And they continue this way until something happens that helps to restore them. And then they move forward in their life in a good way. And so, uh, you know, uh, when we think about the readings that we have here, we have to ask ourselves, well, what does that mean to us? You know, how does that apply to us in our daily lives? And that brings me to C.S. Lewis. Now, that name may not mean anything to some of you. To others, it probably means a lot. For anybody ever heard of, and including anybody here, ever heard of the Chronicles of Narnia? Probably seen some Hollywood movies, The Lion, the Witch, The Wardrobe, uh, Prince Caspian, you know, and, and one, one other one, and uh, The Dawn Treader. And so uh, these, things, these are very popular books and movies for, that are being enjoyed around the world. But that author of that series, C.S. Lewis, was more than just a children's book writer. He was a renowned uh, Christian philosopher, storyteller, and uh, was called upon during World War II in the midst of the war to do some radio talks about uh, Christianity, about God. And he was raised in the Anglican Church. And he was a lay leader. But he was also, well, let me bet, before I get that far in there, let me preface a little bit more. He was enculturated into the normalization that European Christians were morally superior. So many of his values and beliefs, as you explore his entire set of values and beliefs, are based on that culture. But at the same time, he was the kind of person, as a human being, who had the courage and the willingness to step back from all of that and look at, well, what's really true about this? What's really true about Christianity? What's really true about where we come from and why we're doing these things and why we believe what we believe? And for him, in his explorations, especially during the time of World War II when there's the debate over good and evil is really strong and the belief that the Antichrist had already come and was doing the Antichrist thing. Because a lot of people thought Adolf Hitler was the Antichrist at that time, just as others before had been thought likewise and others to follow will be thought likewise. But in that situation, C.S. Lewis had to ask the question, what does it mean to really be uh, in, in harmony with God? And do we have to be Christians to be in harmony with God, or to be right or to be good? And what led this, what pre, what precipitated this uh, evaluation, this exploration to some degree, at least as I understand it, was the fact that the Jewish people, or not the Jews, sorry, the, the, the Nazis, the Nazis believed that what they were doing was according to God's will. That they were good. And that they were justified in doing what they were doing because they were morally superior and chosen of God. So here C.S. Lewis having to say, well, we're doing the same thing. So which one of us is really right? Which one of us has really got God on their side? If God chooses a side. Now without going into 
great elaboration on all the different examinations of what he talked about, uh, because he did he did discuss well how how can God be good if God creates a universe that is so dangerous for human beings to be in? And he explored that, and he answered the question that there is great beauty here in this world, and human beings make choices. But he also got to the place of okay. There was all this strong debate over what is the one unforgivable sin, the one great wrong that can be done, according to his perspective. What what is that great sin? Because you know there are Christ thought about there is one unforgivable sin, and uh, for for C.S. Lewis and his exploration, he came to an understanding that the, the great sin, he calls it that, the great sin in his book, Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis, it's, a, it's the, the radio talks in writing and with some additions. The great sin that human beings experience is pride. And he writes on page 123 of his book, the Christians are right. It is pride which has been the chief cause of misery in every nation, in every family since the world began. Other vices may sometimes bring people together. You may find good fellowship in jokes and friendliness among drunken people or unchaste people. But pride always means enmity. It is enmity. And not only enmity between man and man, but enmity to God. In our Indian religious tradition, you know, uh, haughtiness and pride is greatly frowned upon. It's really, uh, it, it's, it's bad mess. The reason is such is because you know, in, in the spirit of community, in the spirit of Gaduji, in which we live, we recognize that no one is greater than anyone else. We all have different talents. We all have different abilities. Our Creator has called us to specific paths within our life, but everyone contributes to the welfare and the well-being of the community. And as such, each and every human being is valued, loved, and wanted in the role that they play. Because everyone helps the community to be strong. It helps the web of life to thrive and to grow. And yet, when someone becomes prideful, when someone becomes haughty, they adopt the belief that they are better than others. And they are justified and following a path that pursues self-interest instead of self-service. And I want to make sure you understand that service is not meant to be service to self. It is service to the people and to create Self-interest means putting your own welfare and well-being ahead of those others in the community. And what we have seen in historically and in here in North America is each and every human being is involved in a social structure which pursues materialism, pursues wealth. And C.S. Lewis had to address that, just as John addressed that 2,000 years ago. When he wrote, those who love the world do not love God. Those who love materialism is what he was talking about at that time, the context in which he was speaking. Because in the social structure in the first century Palestine, there were the haves and the have-nots, just like there is today. We have a growing separation between the wealthy and the poor occurring in North America and around the world, where the haves and the have-nots 
we're actually going backwards. We're going backwards to the Dark Age periods where there was this huge separation between the rich and the poor. We are headed back that direction more and more each day. And that is contrary to the teachings of our Creator, contrary to Christian teaching, contrary to God's intention for, the, or for creation. And so we have to ask ourselves, what are we doing to contribute to that on a daily basis? Are we doing actions? Are we taking right action? Is what we choose to do helping to improve the quality of life of everyone involved? Or are we seeking to improve our quality of life through inflicting harm on others? And each of us have to examine that through our daily choices. And we have to ask ourselves daily, well, you know, uh, I go look in my closet and I got this big pile of toys that I never use, never play with, and they could probably be cleaned up and taken care of and given to somebody else who might enjoy them. But I'm going to hold on to them. I'm going to hoard them because i got to have them. Or, you know, uh, maybe there's a a class of people who culturally we believe in our in our religion in our communities to be uh, subservient you know less than unworthy undeserving for the Nazis and we hear this over and over again it's been almost a hundred years since the war but the Nazis you know uh, they, they hated the blacks they hated the Jews they were all believing that they were morally superior in that way. And uh, in fact, they didn't even like a lot of white people uh, because they weren't pure white. And so, uh, you know, the things that we can justify, the things that we can rationalize are amazing. And it's, it, that's a big picture thing, but look at our daily lives. We see somebody on the street corner with a tin cup out. You know, and I, do we pass them by? Do we say, oh, that person's probably just, you know, playing this for a fool. They're not really hurting. They don't really need help. Or we say, well, we don't have enough. We can't afford to give this guy a buck or five bucks. So we pass them by. Or we say, we know there's a food bank down the road here. We know there's a soup kitchen over there. Do we help out? Or do we ignore it? Maybe we don't have the money to go and buy food for these people. But maybe one day a week we could go down there and say, hey, we got some time on our hands. How can I help? I got to ask you, because this really sticks with me. This sticks with me. What would the history of North America be if Columbus had showed up in the Bahamas the way he did and said, hey, how can I help? A yeah, whole different world we'd be living in right now. He'd have taken that big old stab with that cross on it, stuck it in the ground and said, God told me to come here and be of service to you. What would you like me to do? Man, the world would be a different place. Even today, how many people think their Christianity is better than others? That they are the true Christianity. When we know, not only from the teachings of the Bible, but other people who have meditated and prayed on this, and struggled with this. You know, we all struggle with this. C.S. Lewis struggled with this himself during the midst of war. How do I know I'm really a Christian? How do I know I'm really talking my or walking my talk? And his answer was simple. His answer was conclusive. And it was a determined answer. And that answer was, if what I am doing is causing harm to someone else, I am not honoring God's truth. I am not walking my walk. I am, in fact, like John says here, you know, those who wander off, whatever, those... I don't know, I have to do some more research on that because I'm still a little confused about all these different antichrists he's talking about, but I gotta tell you, 
if what you're doing is causing harm to someone else, if your self-interest is, is bringing harm to someone else, I have to ask you to think about it and to really do some self-examination. Are you really living God's will? Are you really walking your talk? It's like the Heokas, you know. They come along. I know human beings who are Heokas, and they don't even know they're Heokas because they think that they are justified in inflicting harm on others. They're justified in being haughty and prideful that they deserve it. And other people deserve to be their servants because they are the, who they are. And that is not the way of things. And it's, uh, I mean it pretty regularly. Pretty interesting sometimes to watch some of these people playing it out. And so we have to keep in mind that if you want to be Heoka, that's okay. But when you bring about the destruction, And you stand before God and say, why did you have all this destruction in my life? Why did what I do lead to the destruction of my world, the destruction of my way of life, the destruction of my church, my community? And God's going to look at you and say, hey, that's what you want. So the danger of being a Heoka is the danger of believing that God supports us in inflicting harm on others for our own personal gain. We must watch our motives. Make sure our side of the street is clean on everything we do. And make sure that what we are doing is in harmony with the natural law, the law created by God. It helps us to know when we are doing good and when we are doing harm. Something to think about. You can say what? Walk in beauty.